welcome to the first part of our psychoacoustics lecture on masking by noise. I will start off introducing the range of hearing to you, starting from the faintest sounds that we can hear at the threshold of hearing all the way to the loudest sounds. The range of hearing is limited towards the low end by the hearing threshold. The hearing threshold, or also threshold in quiet, gives us the faintest sounds that are just audible without any other sounds being present. So it just gives us the absolute lower limit of the auditory system, the sounds that are so faint that we just can hear them. It's measured by playing tones and somebody detecting the presence of the tone. When the tone is heard, the person presses a button and indicates this way that the tone is just being heard. By varying the level of the tone, we can now plot down from which point 50% of the trials somebody has heard the tone. You can see here the level of the tone as a function of its frequency and that's depicted as the threshold in quiet, which is also an ISO standard. Tones beyond that threshold are audible as simple tones. And if we rise the level of those tones, then eventually the energy gets so large that we risk damaging the auditory system. Beyond that, and the upper limit of what we can hear, is the threshold of pain, where tones become so painful that they're not only damaging the ears, but actually really creating severe pain. I hope nobody of you has ever experienced that. And even going beyond that risk of damage, I hope you try to avoid when you're going out to clubs and listen to music. Apropos music, where is music located in this picture? Now, music covers frequencies from a few 10 hertz all the way to beyond 10 kilohertz and then can go up to 100 decibels and down to a very few decibels when you're playing in an orchestra very quietly. Now, that's the range for music. The range for speech is a bit more limited goes up to 5, 7, 8 kilohertz, but not below 100 hertz. And when you're whispering, it's a bit more noisy. When you're speaking, then you have harmonic sounds in there, vowels, um, that can have a fundamental frequency going down to about 100 hertz, for female voice about 200 hertz, and we got tongue in this year, the range for speech. So this is about the range of sounds that we hear and we're next coming to what happens when there are other sounds present. So here in this plot we still had the hearing threshold given by just a single tone being audible. But in many situations we have masking sounds, meaning other sounds present. And this comes and brings us to the masking experiment. Now in the simplest case we just take a white noise and we play a tone in that noise. And we ask somebody to tell us when they can hear the tone. So essentially, turn on the noise that goes like and we play a tone. And that tone has been varied in the noise. We can make the intensity of the tone larger. We can reduce the intensity of the tone so as to find just the threshold for detecting the tone in that noise. So unlike the hearing threshold before, this is now in the presence of the noise, but in principle it can be the same experiment. Now, the experiment for our hearing threshold was done often, and that's what the audiologist does, uh, in a single interval procedure. So the tone is being played and somebody has to press the button whether the tone is being heard. Now this has a bias in there, a potential bias, because somebody might be very sensitive to the tone and press the button when there's just a faint tone, something audible. Whereas somebody else might want to hear the tone very clearly, beep, 
and only then starts to press the button and says, wow, there's a tone. This difference is often 10 decibels, and this bias is something that we don't want to have in our experiments. We want to objectify how the experiments come up with results. To do that, we often use forced choice experiments where we play two or three or even more intervals and we hide the signal in one of those intervals. That can be the way it's depicted here, the tone in the first or in the second interval, randomly chosen. So the listener does not know whether the tone is in the first or the second interval. It just happens to be there. And then the person has to detect which interval contained the signal. This can be done by guessing. You get 50% correct. 75% um, correct would be our threshold, 100% correct would be always way above the threshold. You would always detect the tone correctly. This is the standard procedure uh, used for masking experiments, often also with three uh, intervals. And this comes out to the following results for a tone masked by white noise. Now, what is white noise? You should know probably already. White noise is a noise that has a constant spectral density, constant energy per frequency band. So say per one hertz or 10 hertz or so on. You always have the same amount of energy irrespective of frequency. And we depict this with a small letter of L uh, as a function of frequency, as you see here on the top right. So the spectral density level, small l, uh, is constant frequency independent as depicted here. Now if we play into that noise a tone, we get the masking pattern for that tone. And this is what's depicted here in the main graph. So the main graph shows us the level of the tone as a function of its frequency when it's just being audible in that noise. And you see that when the spectral density level of the noise is at minus 10 decibels, the curve just goes up above the threshold in quiet that we already saw before. If we increase the level of the noise in 10 decibel steps, here to 0, to 10, 20, 30, and so on, we see that the tones level has to be increased in equal steps. Namely, each time there is about a 10 decibel difference between those lines. So that's very nice. The level of the tone has to be increased by about 10 dB when we increase the level of the noise by about 10 dB. So it's basically a linear process in a wide area here. What we also see is that towards higher frequencies, um, there's a slight rise in this curve. And this is because our auditory filters get wider towards higher frequencies. And we'll see this later in the chapter on frequency uh, selectivity and critical bands. So a white noise can mask a tone and increase the threshold of the tone across the whole spectrum. Here picked it from 100 Hz to 10 kHz. Let me now demonstrate you the effects of masking. I brought you an audio demonstration where I play a white noise like you see it here and into that noise I play a tone and then I reduce the level of the tone step by step and eventually you will not hear the tone anymore. It's been masked by the noise. Lastly, I'll play the tone alone. You will hear it's still there. It's just been not audible because of the noise being present. Besides masking by white noise and white band noise that covers all frequencies, we want to next consider what happens if we reduce the bandwidth of the noise so that the noise is more specific to certain frequencies. We call this narrowband noise and it comes by filtering out, by cutting out certain frequency ranges from the wideband noise. 
If we now look at the masking evoked by this na narrowband noise, we see that it is likewise specific to the frequencies contained in the noise. But nevertheless, it also continues to last towards higher and lower frequencies. Moreover, if we shift the center frequency of the noise, we see that masking shifts with it. So it's still specific to it, but there are also flanks where there's no energy of the noise and there is still masking present. I've also brought you a, de a demonstration for this masking by narrowband noise. And uh, the narrowband noise has 1200 hertz. And I play tones from 900 to 1.8 kilohertz uh, that sort of go through it, um, through that noise. You will first hear the tones and then they will sort of disappear in the noise. They will be masked by the noise. They will still play it. Uh, and then eventually you'll start to hear them again when they come out of the masking pattern on the other side. So the 900 hertz to 1800 hertz, that's a one octave range. And we see that the noise, which was uh, not too strong relative to the tones, um, was masking still quite a bit uh, of this one octave range. This brings me to the summary of the first part of our psychoacoustic lecture on masking. We started off when looking at the hearing range from the faintest sounds that we can hear, which are depicted in the threshold of hearing. Um, the threshold of hearing uh, is about zero decibels and around mid-frequency region and then rises sharply towards the low and even more sharply towards the high frequencies. The hearing range itself is also limited by the very high level sounds. We should not go beyond uh, the risk of damage limit or even beyond the threshold of pain. If we now play not only single tones like we did it to determine the thresholds, but mass tones play other sounds by noise, uh, then we see that other sounds, in this case white noise, can mask our tones, making them inaudible. So we raise the threshold of audibility by presenting that noise. Interestingly, this is a linear effect for most frequencies. So if we have white noise and we give 10 decibels more of noise, our threshold will also increase by roughly 10 decibels. Last but not least, we saw that what happens when you narrowband filter the noises, that masking is specific to the frequencies of the masker. There are slopes, there are flanks towards lower and higher frequencies at which masking decays. So it's not only evoked directly by the frequency of the maskers. Um, there's still masking towards lower and higher frequencies, but it is still around the center frequencies of the masker where most of the masking will occur. I thank you for listening in this first part and we'll continue right away with the second part on masking.